Well, good morning. good morning and Merry Christmas to each of you, to those that have braved the weather conditions and are here this morning. Don't you wish it was snow instead of rain? I sure do. Uh, what a joy it is to gather, whether it's here in the sanctuary or at home virtually, to celebrate this fourth Sunday of the Advent season. And those of you at home missed the beautiful prelude that Janice played. Janice, thank you for that gift. I hope you got to enjoy our carols of the season, the songs of the season from right here earlier this week on Facebook Live. If you didn't, scroll back through our videos on our Facebook page and enjoy Amy and Mark and others playing and singing songs of the season. Janice playing and and uh, Mark's cousin James, what a great gift of music that was to us. So we're so glad you're here today. We're going to have some great music today as well. We're going to break open God's Word, and we're going to worship together, even in this dark, gray, yucky day. I want you to hear John chapter 1 as our call to worship this morning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was present to God. And the Word was God, in readiness for God from day one. And everything was created through Him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without Him. What came into existence was life. And the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness. And the darkness could not put it out. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life, he brings into light. He was in the world. The world was there through him, and yet the world didn't even notice him. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made them to be their true selves. The Word became flesh and blood. And moved into the neighborhood. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God this morning for that call to worship. The darkness cannot overcome the light. For the light has come and moved into the neighborhood. Won't you pray with me as we begin this morning? God, shine your light into the darkness. The darkness of... This dismal day, the darkness of a global pandemic, the darkness of disease and destruction and distance and struggle, Lord, shine your light. For we know that your light cannot be put out. And Lord, we know that if we choose to walk in it, as we walk in the light, we become our true selves and we walk alongside you for you came and moved into our neighborhood. Well, that's what Christmas is all about. And so, as we gather today, may we draw nearer to you light, love, for the season. We pray in the name of the one who became flesh and blood, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, this morning we light our fourth Advent candle, and I left the first three unlit just so I can remind you what each one was. On the first Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of hope, a reminder that even in difficult days, we have a God in which we can hope, a God who comes into our presence and offers us strength for today, and as the hymn says, bright hope for tomorrow. Our second candle on the Advent wreath is the candle of peace. And Paul has shared with you the chaos of the Christmas story. A teenager who becomes pregnant, whose husband is about to leave her. Chaos in the town, murmuring and rumors. And into the chaos, God speaks his peace. And he tells us that while the murmurings and the rumors may not stop, his peace still reigns. Last week, we lit the candle of joy. 
And we heard the story of the shepherds who were out in their fields watching over their flock by night. And lo, there appeared the angels who said they came with good news of great joy, even for the shepherds. And that joy is for us as well. And so our Advent wreath is almost lit in its entirety. Today we come to light the fourth candle on this last Sunday before Advent. And we do so unwrapping the gift of love. Here are these words to a contemporary Christmas hymn called Love Came Down at Christmas Time. It says, close your eyes and share the dream. Let everyone on earth believe. The child was born, the star shone bright, and love came down at Christmas time. Christmas Eve, 2 a.m., heavy snow is falling down, and the streets clothed in white echo songs that were sung by candlelight. We're alive. We can breathe. But do we really care for this world in need? There's a choice we must make each and every day. So close your eyes and share the dream. Let everyone on earth believe the child was born, the star shone bright. And love, love came down at Christmas time. So Merry Christmas, everyone, and peace throughout the year. The time has come to celebrate, so let your voices fill the air. Everyone watch and pray that the sun will shine on a brighter day. Join hands, lift them high for this gift of life when love came down at Christmas time. Love came down. As John's Gospel said, the Word became flesh. God in the flesh love, and moved into the neighborhood. As we light this candle of love, may you know that you are loved and that God has called you into all the world to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen and amen. Gwen, come and bless us, if you would, with a Christmas medley to remind us that love has come down.
Miss Janice and I are going to do a little dance here. Good morning, everybody. We are going to continue our series today through the uh, Christmas angels. We have been learning about the uh, Christmas angels. And you might remember, God sends his angels to give us glimpses of how he is taking care of us. And to, um, and to give us messages at times. And so our first angel came to visit Mary and brought really big news that she was going to have the baby Jesus. Our second angel came to Joseph, and Joseph was really confused about this new baby coming. And so the second angel came with words of comfort for Joseph and helped him understand what God's plan was. And then the third angel that visited last week was a group of angels, and those angels came on Christmas Eve to the shepherds to let them know that Jesus had been born and to teach the shepherds how to worship him. This morning we are going to meet a fourth angel. This angel came to visit Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, probably when Jesus was almost a year old. It says, King Herod was just about the meanest king in the world. When he heard about the baby Jesus, he didn't like it one bit. He didn't want the baby to grow up and become king and take away his throne. King Herod wanted to hurt the baby, but God was not going to let anyone hurt the baby Jesus and his family. And so God sent another angel to Joseph to warn him in a dream. And the angel said, Joseph, take the baby and Mary and go far away to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you it is safe to come home. So Joseph got up right then, packed up Mary and the baby, and took them on a very long trip to Egypt, where they would live for about five years or more. Today, our angel, our fourth angel, reminds us that God protects us. God tells us about the big plans and the big news he has for each of our lives. God helps us when we're confused and we don't understand everything. God teaches us how to worship Him and to praise Him and have a relationship with Him. And God always protects us. Let's pray together today. Lord, this Christmas season, we want to be like your angels. We want to be a people that shares good news. We want to be a people that encourage other folks. And so today, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes and hearts to those that we encounter this week. Help us to see those that need encouragement. And give us the words and the ways to be encouragers. And Lord, we want to be like your angels. We want to be good listeners. We want to help people and pray for people as they struggle through confusing and difficult times. And so we lift up you to, to you today. Those in our family, our friends, our neighbors, people in our community that are struggling with questions of what do I do now? What do I do next? I don't understand what's happening. I don't see where you are, God. Lord, we pray that you would use us, that you would use our church, that you would put in the lives of each of those confused people human angels who can listen and encourage and support those that are confused and lost today. And Lord, we want to be a people that worships you in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the things that are so different this year. 
We want to be a people that rejoices and marvels at the way you are present and working things together for the will, your will. And so, Lord, help us to be angels of worship this holiday season. And help us to teach our children and the generations coming up behind us to worship you. And, Lord, we pray today. We pray for all those that need angels of protection around them. We pray for those that need to experience an angel of healing in their life. And Lord, we ask that you would do that work. Father, we pray for healing and for comfort and for wholeness of those that we love that need to experience your healing touch today. We ask all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Paula. Got a few prayer requests this morning that have come in, and I want to share a few of them with you uh, in a little more anonymous way than I might normally. But we've uh, we've had a friend in the church that broke her arm and asked that she would be praying for Marie. We have a uh, friend Emmy who had knee replacement surgery and is struggling in the recovery there. So please be in prayer for Emmy. Lift up Miss Lucy, who's been hospitalized with pneumonia and hopefully will be home uh, again soon. Uh, there are many others uh, who need our prayers. Uh, I think of Miss Peggy and Miss Julia, both who are uh, continue to struggle day to day with some challenges. Uh, I think of Ishmael and Stan, neighbors of ours that need our prayers. Uh, there are so many in our congregation and community that need to be lifted up. And I had the joy of receiving some compliments on your behalf as I spoke uh, with Brenda this morning, whose husband Jerry is in the hospital, and she said to me, Scott, thank everyone for their prayers and their care. It is wonderful to be part of a community that cares enough to lift us up in prayer. What a joy that is to know. And so I ask that you would continue to be in prayer for those in need, that you would let us know in the church office how we can be praying for those closest to you. I lift up the Briner family with whom I got to spend Friday as we buried the matriarch of that family. And I got to connect with them through a ministry connection on the other side of the world. God puts us where we need to be when we need to be there to remind folks of his presence and his love. And so today, knowing that, and knowing that God shows up, and he shows up in and through us together, I want you to hear these words of uh, Psalm 148 and 149. Remember, the Psalms are the great hymn book of Scripture, the great hymn book or the great song book of history, really. Places where we turn again to listen to the lyrics that help us through. And before Gwen comes and blesses us again, I want you to hear why it's so important to take your old 45s and your 33s and put them on the record player or to pull up that fake fireplace with the sounds of the season. Listen to what it says. It says, Hallelujah. Praise God from heaven. Praise Him from the mountaintops. Praise Him, all you angels. Praise Him, all you His warriors. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, you morning stars. Praise Him, high heaven. Praise Him, it's fitting for this morning, heavenly rain clouds. Praise, oh, let them praise the name of God. He spoke the word, and there they were. He set them in place from all time to eternity. He gave his orders, and that's it. Praise God from earth. And then Psalm 149 says, Hallelujah, sing to God a brand new song. Praise him in the company of all who love him. Celebrate the sovereign creator. Y'all ready for this? Now, Baptists have struggled with this verse for centuries. Let them praise his name in dance. Strike up the band and make great music. And why? Because God delights in his people. Praise him with dance. 
Have y'all ever turned on music when you're around toddlers? Do you know what little people do when the music turns on? They start moving, even babies in the car seats, right? And the next thing you know, things are happening. They've never been taught that. But the music makes them come alive. I believe God planted that in us. And rather than dancing for you all this morning, I'll choose that form of praise in my own home. But I want to remind you that no matter how foolish you may feel or look, that if it's welling up out of your heart, that's the kind of praise God desires in this season, when we're reminded that He was willing to look foolish for us, to be born in a stable and laid in a feeding trough that we might know His love. When will you come and sing and bless us with a new song this morning? <clears throat>
just like that first Christmas night. Wasn't that divine? What a gift, Gwen, and thank you for sharing that with us. And Janice, thank you. Those of you at home couldn't see it, but Deacon Sam, who is working our camera so that you can enjoy the service, was rubbing his arms with chills during that song. Oh, night divine. You know, this Christmas Eve, it's supposed to pour down rain, and so come back and watch that and let that song warm you up on the cold, wet night that we're supposed to have. I want us to continue to unwrap Advent today. We've unwrapped the gift of hope, and we listened to Isaiah's prophecy that said, God will lead us down a new road in difficult days. We've unwrapped the gift of peace as Paula talked about finding Christ's calm in the chaos. Last week we unwrapped the gift of joy as we realized that even the shepherds way out on the outskirts were given the opportunity to be part of the Christmas celebration. And today we come to unwrap the gift of love. Now I want you to help confirm the research that I did this week in preparation. There are two main Christmas stories in the Gospels. Mark doesn't have one. Mark starts with Jesus as an adult. John, well I read John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's John's introduction to Jesus. But Matthew and Luke both give us Christmas stories. And I want to read through them quickly. I'm not going to read every verse, but I want you to be listening for the words of Advent and see if you hear today's gift unwrapped. Remember our candles of hope, peace, joy, and love. Hear now the Gospels, the good news, in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. Matthew begins, the family tree of Jesus Christ, David's son, Abraham's son. And he goes through the lineage, and it says there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, and another 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and yet another 14 from the Babylonian exile to Christ. And one of these years we'll dig into that genealogy, it's beautiful. And now beginning in verse 16, it said the birth of Jesus took place like this. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. And before they came to the marriage bed, Joseph discovered she was pregnant. It was by the Holy Spirit, but he didn't know that. And Joseph, chagrined but noble, determined to take care of things quietly so Mary would not be disgraced. Paul read this. While he was trying to figure out a way, he had a dream, and God's angel spoke in the dream. Joseph, son of David, don't hesitate to get married. Mary's pregnancy spirit conceived. And it goes on, she will bring a son to birth, and when she does, you, Joseph, will name him Jesus. God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. Then moving into Luke chapter 2. About that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. I love this passage, because so often at Christmas we have different people reading the story of Christmas, and they love when they get to these words like Quirinius. It's one of the fun things. If you watch a Christmas special, you can see actors tense up before they get to that name. Quirinius was the governor. Everyone had to travel to their ancestral hometown to be accounted for, so Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there, and he went with Mary's fiance, who was pregnant. And while there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to a son, her firstborn, and wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them. It says here in the hostel, in the end. And there were shepherds camping in the neighborhood, and they had set their watch at night over their sheep, and suddenly God's angel stood among them and said, Excuse me, glory blazed around them. They were terrified. And the angel said, do not be afraid. I'm here to announce great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior's been born in David's town. A Savior who is Messiah, the Lord. What gift are we unwrapping today? Hope, peace, joy, and 
love. But in the Christmas story, love is unspoken. The word love isn't used at all. And that smacked me in the face this week. I would expect in this story, when God comes to us, to hear the word love, 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 and it's just not there. You can look in different trans. The word love isn't there. So I began to think about how many times I heard my mother and my grandmother say this. Scott, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. Nowhere is the word love spoken in the Christmas story. And yet, it's woven throughout. And the entire thing is a testament to God's love for you and for me and for our whole world. The word love is missing in the text. But here's what I want you to know about Christmas. Everywhere Jesus is, love is is there. Everywhere Jesus is, love is there. And so throughout the Christmas story, we find love. We find love not in the words of the texts, but in the action that God chose on that first Christmas. First thing I want you to hear this morning in the text is, and, and the first action that I believe God took to show you and me love and to yell it out without using the word is simply this. He stepped down to show up. God stepped down to show up. Here's how Paul records it in Philippians. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal stature with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status quo no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave becoming human. And having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and died a selfless, obedient death. The worst kind of death, the crucifixion. And because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far above anyone or anything so that all created beings in heaven and on earth will bow down and worship before Jesus the Christ. God stepped down so that he could show up to us. And that is what love is all about. Love's about people showing up. Love's about people showing up. And y'all, that's hard to do right now, isn't it? It's so hard to show up because in the chaos of this virus, even when we show up, we, we stop short. I saw a special this week on the news of a phys ed teacher that drove over 1,200 miles inside the town where he taught so that he could show up to the homes of his students. And he would simply do this, knock on the door, step back down in the suburban neighborhood to the sidewalk at the end of the driveway, invite his students, mostly I think middle school kids, to come out of their home and to exercise with him to do some push-ups, some jumping jacks, some stretches. And then he would tell them a dad joke, as only a middle school PE teacher can do. And they would roll their eyes and laugh. And then he would remind them of three things. I love you, I miss you, and we'll be back together soon. The PE teacher showed up. And they interviewed this one little sixth grade girl. She was absolutely precious. And she said, I looked out the window and oh my goodness, do you know who was there? My gym teacher. Exasperated. Oh my gosh. 
And they all told the same dad joke over and over again that he had shared with them. That wasn't really funny, but Lester Holt thought it was good enough to share with his grandkids. God stepped down so that he could show up. This teacher stepped down from his classroom, stepped down out of his truck or his car, onto the sidewalk so that he could show up to the people he loved. And love steps down and shows up. But in 2020, I think that looks a little different than maybe it has in the past. I saw this morning a photo of a friend's family Christmas celebration. They had a flat screen TV on the wall and a computer monitor and a laptop and a camera. And it was their family Christmas celebration at three different locations using the technology they had. They stepped down from their expectations that Christmas would look a certain way, that the celebration would be what it had always been, in the way that it always was, and they showed up in the way that they could by teaching themselves a new way. I'll be honest, y'all, this thing is not always easy. That's me right there, by the way, about 15 seconds ago. And this thing is hard to get used to. It's hard sometimes to realize that that may be the only way we can communicate, but let me tell you, it is so worth learning some new technology when you see the doors that it opens for you to show up. Whether that's somebody in the hospital where there are no visitors allowed and you can show up at the bedside on a screen and remind that person maybe as they take their last breaths, you're not alone. Maybe it's showing up, as my friends did, on a flat screen and a computer monitor and a phone to locations around the country to say, hey, we can't physically be together, but we're here to show up to one another. We want to be like Jesus who stepped down to show up. I believe it was Tuesday night of last week. I was scrolling through my phone late at night in bed. Paula and I were comparing notes as we went through our Facebook feeds and in popped a message Boop. from a friend that Paula and I met here in Fayetteville that now lives on the other side of the world in Malaysia. That friend reached out and said, Scott, we have a dear friend in Raleigh whose mom just had a stroke. We can't be present to them. Would you, on our behalf, step down and show up to this family? You're close enough. While we were texting, I said, most definitely, how can I pray? What happened? And they began to give me the details. And as they text some more, the next text came in. The mom has taken her last breath. She's died. Will you reach out to the family and be present in a way that we can't? from here. This little box pinged a satellite to another box on the other side of the world and allowed the presence of Christ to be passed so that one could step down and show up and cry out love in the difficult days even of this season. I was so humbled to be trusted with that gift. The word love isn't mentioned in the Christmas story, but we find it because God stepped down to show up. My question for you this morning is where have you seen him showing up in your life? Where have you seen God step down and show up? He showed up for me in two places this week. Two places that I normally wouldn't expect to see love. One was in our youth room over the Xbox, and the other was in my living room playing some other awful video game. I am not a gamer. Let me repeat that. I am not a gamer. Video games seem so pointless to me. I don't enjoy them. They're loud. They just seem goofy and crazy. But my children love those games. 
They love him. And I can't understand why. And day after day, I remind them that I don't understand why they like those things. Wouldn't they rather go play basketball or throw a football or do something that I like to do? No, Dad. We want to go play Fortnite. We want to play Brawlhalla. We want to... And so much wiser than I, my bride said, Scott, why don't you step down and show up? And my little one said, Dad, I want to teach you how to play Fortnite. Now, when I was growing up, the games that I played were on the Atari system that had one stick and one button, and that was huge at the time. The controllers now have more buttons and more things in different places that I know what to do with. In fact, I can't even hold the controller without accidentally hitting a button and changing the screen and messing it up. It stresses me to no end. But my 12-year-old said, Dad, I want to teach you. I want to teach you how to play. And so I picked up the controller. And y'all, I can talk a good game. I told him how I was going to kick his fanny in this game. And my guy was going to whoop his tail. Y'all, I got on there. I didn't know what I was doing. I would duck when I was trying to swing. And I would swing when I was supposed to jump. And my character would get thumped down and kicked off the screen. And I would say, am I dead? And he'd say, yeah, dad, you're dead. Do I get to try again? Sure. Hey, how do I build that thing? Well, you just hit Y. Well, where's Y? Well, it's over there next to X. Well, where's X? It's on the other side of A and B. But you got to go left when you hit that or it won't build that up. Did I tell you I'm not a gamer? But in that moment, the face of my 12-year-old lit up. Dad, I want to teach you how to play my game. My 13-year-old, last night, said, Dad, we can't play that game that's on the Xbox there, but will you play this game in our living room? I said, what is it? He said, it's Brawlhalla. I said, cool, what does that mean? He says, we brawl, awesome. I know how to brawl, except he handed me another controller with more buttons, and they were smaller this time. And I had to do this. And I tell you this story because in that moment, Not only was I getting kicked off the screen and he was left to fight the bad guys by himself, but at one point he said, Dad, let's play it so that we're on a team. And we got to fight together against the bad guys. I wasn't much of a help. In fact, sometimes I hit him when I wasn't supposed to. I didn't know what I was doing. But love steps down at Christmas time. Love stepped down at Christmas time. Had my bride not encouraged me, I don't know that I would have done that because, y'all, I'm not a gamer. I don't like that stuff. But here's what I learned. My kids have some skills that I don't. They have some dexterity that I don't. They have some capabilities that I don't. And those translate into other places. And that when I step down from my high horse of video games are stupid, man, I don't like those things. And I get alongside them when I show up. Love happens. Christmas is about stepping down and showing up. I've told this story many times. Of waking up early, I believe in West Georgia, for a cross-country meet. Being out warming up and seeing a little old man with gray hair jogging across the field and turning to my teammates and saying, doesn't that guy look like my dad? And they nodded and smiled, and then I looked again, and I said, that is my dad. And the people you know as Jay and Kay had driven 12 hours through the night and slept in the parking lot to show up, to be there to cheer me on. Love steps down to show up, to cheer us on, to be present. The word love isn't in the story, but it's shouted through the actions of showing up. The last thing that I want you to hear, not only did love step down to show up, but love reached out wide to draw us in close. 
Love reached out wide to draw us in close. It almost seems counterintuitive, right? To get here, you have to first reach way out here. How do I, how do I know that? Well, just read the story. Who's included in the Christmas story? A teenager. A teenager. A teenage girl. It's one of the stars of the Christmas story. A blue-collar carpentry apprentice works with his hands and makes things in his shop. Joseph is included in the Christmas story. Last week we talked about the shepherds, the outcasts. God reaches out and pulls them in. They're included in the Christmas story. We later find out the magi, right? The high and mighty, if you will, the highly respected folks from another country, God reaches out and pulls them in. In the interim, we find the people like Mark and Kim Wyatt that run the Welcome House in Raleigh, welcoming refugees into our time. Jesus and Joseph and Mary were welcomed into somebody's home in Egypt as they fled across borders, not knowing where to go or what to do. And God opened his arms wide and pulled those people in. And time and again throughout Scripture, we see God opening His arms wider and wider. He didn't just come to the religious folk sitting in the pews at the church and say, I have arrived for you. But instead, He said, shepherds, come. Teenager, come. He was born as a baby to remind us that children are welcome. He talks to Mary through an angel. He says, young lady, you're here. He talks to Joseph the carpenter. He talks to the Magi and the Welcome House people and everybody in between. Christmas screams out love because it reaches so wide to pull us all in. I saw that come to life in my high school hallways. I don't know about your high school experience, but at mine, Fridays were game days during football season. And the cheerleaders and the football team wore their jerseys and their cheer outfits to school that day. And they owned the hallways. Do you know what I'm talking about? When they came in their jerseys, everybody parted because oh, the football team had arrived. I know what I'm talking about. Well, I had the joy of being introduced my freshman year to a young man named John who had cerebral palsy. And John was an amazing guy. He was in our inclusion class of special education. My high school was the hub for the whole county of those inclusion classes, and John was there. And John was involved in everything, and John's parents set him free to do that. And John got to know the athletic trainer at our school that we called Dr. Duck. And Duck said to John, work alongside me. When I need a roll of tape, you can reach into the toolbox and grab me a roll of tape. And when I need scissors, you hand scissors. And you can help me tape angles and get water bottles. And you can be on the sidelines with the football team. Well, John was in seventh heaven. But you see, something, something even more powerful happened. Because the team wanted to reach out their arms wider and pull John in. And so they gave John a jersey. And so on Fridays, this skinny guy who had trouble talking and who walked up on his toes and was in the special ed class had a football jersey. And when he walked down the halls, he got the high fives from everybody and people split and he was in. Love. It screamed out in the Christmas story. The word's not in there. But God reaches his arms out wide to pull us in. And he puts the jersey on us. And he says, you are mine. And I am here for you. And I came and showed up in your neighborhood. That you can someday live in mine. Folks, love's unspoken in the Christmas story but it's shouted more loudly than anything. And as Jesus stepped down to show up, and as he reached out wide to pull all of us in, we are called to do the same. 
Will you step down in some way? Maybe you're a senior adult that says, I don't want to learn how to do this. I don't want to learn how to use one of those idiot boxes. I like the cord on my phone. But man, when you can text a kid and they can text you back, it can change your heart and theirs. Maybe like me, you need to get off your high horse and realize that video games or whatever else it is that your kids or grandkids are doing, maybe they're not so evil. Love steps down and shows up and it reaches out wide. Is there somebody that you think, you know, they, they need to know they're part of the Christmas celebration as well. The word love isn't in the story, but everywhere Jesus is, love is there. And you and I are his body. Let's pray. Lord, I read the lyrics of that beautiful Christmas song, Love Came Down at Christmas Time. Thank you. Thank you for showing up. Thanks for cheering us up. And thanks for reminding us that you came for everybody, not just the high and mighty, not just the shepherds on the outside, but everybody, the teenagers and the men and the women, the refugees and the struggling, the rich and the poor, the religious and those outside at the religious institutions. Pull us in, God. Show up for us and help us to step down and show up this season. To reach wide and pull in all people that they would know the love that is Christmas. We pray in the name of Jesus, who is love. Amen and amen. Before you go today, it looks like through our windows here that the sun is starting to come out. And that is a great thing. It's going to be a beautiful couple of days. But the forecast for Christmas Eve stinks. Absolutely is awful. It looks like it's going to be raining buckets. We have an outdoor service planned of candlelight and communion and casual service in the rain. Hang tight. We're going to put out some announcements for what that's going to look like based on the forecast as it's changing. You can pray that that rain might turn to snow and then we can be out in it and enjoy it. It may snow on Christmas Day, they're saying possibly, and I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor and pray that it would, I love snow. But stay tuned, we'll put out here on Facebook uh, our plans for Christmas Eve. If the weather is yucky, we may do uh, a virtual service so that you can sit by the fire in your home and curl up with the people you love and still be part of uh, a worship in a safe environment where you're not out on the roads in the yuck. Uh, so more to follow on that. God bless. Merry Christmas. Unwrap love and be love as you show up and as you reach out wide. Amen and amen. Go in peace.